Hello and welcome to this audio-visual presentation on the topic of aggression. In this session we're going to explore the, the nature of aggression, its potential origins and some of its causes and triggers on a day-to-day -day basis. And I hope to present to you some insights into aggression, ways of looking at it that you might not have considered before. It's interesting that depending on who you talk to sort of in the, in the general public about aggression, some feel that aggression doesn't really need an explanation that it's almost a, a natural state of being for animals to be aggressive and competitive in, in, in an almost instinctive way and that man is no different and as such the fact that man can be aggressive towards its own species, other men or other species is a sort of a natural state of being and for these people it's that sort of behaviour doesn't need explanation it's when man isn't aggressive, when man is sort of friendly and cooperative that's what for them needs some kind of special explanation and yet for other people it's the exact opposite they feel that animals including man are, are born in a naturally sort of friendly and, and cooperative state and that it's when we become violent and aggressive towards each other that that's the mystery and that needs to be explained I guess you could boil those two points down to a sort of a fundamental question about whether or not we are born friendly or born unfriendly and uh, you know what is a, an instinct and what is learned through uh, our experiences with others. Um, I hope to explore some of those questions here today and to present to you with some of the research which might shed a little light on uh, those questions and others. Before we go any further I think it might be a useful exercise for us to decide what is aggression. What do we consider to be an example of aggressive behaviour? Now imagine if I ask you just to imagine an aggressive behaviour, something will pop into your head, the, an example that sort of is a, uh, a prototypical example in your imagination of what aggressive behaviour is. But let's see if we can maybe examine some of the the boundaries of that that image you have of aggression. How far does it extend? When does it stop being aggression maybe and become something else? And in order to explore that I've got a, a series of behaviours here on the screen. And in each case I'm asking you to decide would you have called this an example of aggressive behaviour? If somebody described that behaviour to you, would you have thought that's aggression? Now I need you to pause the recording and for each one make your decision whether yes it is aggression or no it's not. And uh, go with your, your instinct on this one, don't overthink it too much, just look at the behaviour and decide what's your first impression. Is that an aggressive behaviour or is it not? So pause the recording and go and then when you're ready start the recording again. Right, hopefully you've uh, had a go at that exercise and decided which of these behaviours is aggression and which is not. And let's see if we can look at the things that you've decided are aggression and look at the ones that you've decided are not and use that to help us understand how you see aggression. Now, obviously I can't see what you've put down, but from running this session with uh, sort of classes of people, I've found that generally speaking there are certain things that are instantly seen as aggression punching people, uh, kicking people, doing something which is considered to be sort of physically hostile towards another person is almost always classified as an aggression. Um, and yet there are other behaviours on here which are less certain to be aggression. Some people would consider them to be, others would not. So for example scratching somebody's car with their keys, somebody would consider, some people would consider that an aggressive behaviour other people would consider it just to be a nasty or unpleasant behaviour. Uh, similarly, spreading a rumour about somebody. Again, some people would consider that to be sort of a, a, a sort of an example of unpleasant behaviour, but not necessarily aggressive behaviour. And with the the issues like kicking somebody in a karate class or slapping a child. There, people are less certain that that's aggression. They may consider it to be unacceptable to slap a child's hand, but might not consider it to be aggression because it's not being done in anger, but being done as a punishment. And last but not least, with extreme behaviours like the one of uh, killing somebody with an axe, almost everybody would consider that to be aggression, although there, there are some people who might not. There, are Some people might say, well, that's not aggressive behaviour, that's, that's insane behaviour, that's madness not aggression. 
Now, it would be interesting for you to consider where did you fall on those various things? Did you consider to be slapping a child to be aggression or not? Did it matter to you why they were doing it? Uh, what about spreading a rumour? Was that aggression? Is it as a good an example of aggression as, as punching somebody? Or is there a difference between those two? If they're, if they're both forms of aggression, are they different varieties of aggression? Or is one aggression and the other is not? And what about going to the extremes? Is, is punching somebody in an argument a form of aggression in the same way that killing them with an axe is a form of aggression? Or again, are they... Is there some substantial difference between the two things that means you couldn't call them both aggression? You'd have to give them either different forms of aggression or even one is aggression and the other is not. What has this exercise revealed to us? What has it revealed to you by reflecting on your own answers? Chances are, for most people, it reveals that their definition of aggression is similar to the one that had been used in psychology for a long time i.e. that aggression is a, about causing physical harm and uh, physical aggression towards other people. This is generally the way we, we tend to define aggression and view it. Um, it's interesting though that even that traditional definition of aggression would have included forms of aggression, or forms of behaviour rather, that we might not call aggression, so to, uh, to slap a child's hand even under the traditional definitions of aggression which focus on physical behaviour and physical harm that would still be considered to be aggression even though our everyday definition of aggression wouldn't include it in an everyday sense we wouldn't consider slapping a child's hand to be aggression because it's not done in anger often and it's not done to, to sort of um, it's done with a purpose where we're trying to sort of punish them, teach them a lesson however even to a traditional definition of aggression the point of slapping a child's hand is to hurt them. The pain is supposed to be a punishment and therefore it is aggression, even if in your mind or the mind of other people um, there's a very big difference between that and sort of a punch-up between two adults. It's possibly because we have come to see physical punishments like this in the same light as other forms of aggression that they've become so unacceptable socially in that we no longer consider uh, corporal punishment to be something acceptable for a teacher to do or even for a parent to do, that we recognise it as a form of aggression which is likely to have negative consequences both for the child and for ourselves. What's interesting though is that the modern definition of aggression goes even further and includes psychological harm. That's, this is the definition that you're seeing at the top of the slide. This is a more recent development. Um, now, this inclusion of, of psychological harm and saying that basically when we try to hurt somebody psychologically, it's a form of aggression just in the same way as when we try to hurt them physically. Now, this would include behaviours like spreading rumours or scratching their car or sort of, you know, cutting them out of your social, not inviting them to your party. These would all be forms of psychological aggression. Now, to those people who favour the traditional definition of aggression, it's not that they're denying that these behaviours exist or that they're intended to cause harm. They, they would simply suggest that physical harm is different from other kinds of harm and that uh, effectively there are likely to be different causes for physical harm or physical aggression compared to emotional harm or psychological aggression and so that we shouldn't try to lump them all together under one definition and try to find common explanations for all of them, they're too different. Um, however, those who favour the broader definition of aggression, which includes both physical and, and psychological aggression in, in one definition and says really they're, they're sort of two sides of the same coin, those people would feel that there are common factors across all kinds of uh, aggression and that to sort of artificially separate physical and psychological and say these are different things and they're not both aggression would be to hide the fact that there might be common features, common factors to all of these forms of aggression and for them therefore they should be grouped together. Now this debate over the, the definition of aggression is important for us because it challenges us to consider whether or not we would agree that um, physical aggression and psychological aggression are really two versions of the same thing. 
Uh, is the, are the behaviours which cause psychological distress and pain, are they really aggression? I would say your, your initial reaction is likely to be no, that you're not used to thinking of aggression in these way, this way. But I would reserve judgment on that one. Hold back and consider after you've seen the rest of the session what you, whether you might change your view on that. Certainly the broader definition of aggression, which views attention to cause psychological harm, as just another form of aggression is becoming the more widely used version. And so it might be worth considering if your own personal definition of aggression uh, could use a little bit of updating. But let's move on now to explore aggression in more detail. We'll move on now and for the purposes of the rest of the session I'm going to be assuming the broader definition here that effectively when I talk about aggression it could apply just as much to physical aggression as it could to psychological aggression causing physical harm or psychological or emotional harm. Now with that in mind I want to divide up the rest of this session into sort of two sections. In the first section we're going to try to explore the origins of aggressive behaviour. Why in general does aggression exist? What purpose does the behaviour serve? Why does aggression exist at all as a behaviour in, in human beings? And um, what are the sort of biological and, and physical factors which might explain aggressive, aggressive behaviour? But also, what are the social ones? In what way might we be sort of trained or conditioned to be aggressive by the way we're brought up? In the second part of the session then, I want to look at specific causes for aggressive incidents. So the first section I might be asking why are, is, why are people aggressive or not aggressive in general. In the second section I want to ask what are the particular events or incidents or environmental factors which might trigger a specific aggressive behaviour and uh, how can we use them to understand why, why aggression happens in some incidences and not in others. I said at the start of this audiovisual presentation that to some people aggressive behaviour and aggression in, in, in man is not something that requires too much of an explanation. To them it's, it's a fairly simple issue. You ask them well, why is man aggressive and their answer is that man like all animals as, they're far, as far as they're concerned have aggressive instincts and that essentially we, are, we have it hardwired into us from the moment we're born. Um, now, you, if you were to challenge on this and go, well, how do you know man has aggressive instincts? They would simply point to all the aggression around them and say, look, uh, look, these people are, all, are always violent, they're always aggressive. But that becomes a kind of circular logic where the thing you're looking for becomes proof uh, of its own existence, that aggressive instincts are proved by aggression, and aggression is caused by aggressive instincts, and that's kind of circular logic. And this is the problem with the, the attempt to explain aggression simply as an instinct. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't give us any kind of insights into why aggress aggression exists or how the, the, the basic wiring of aggression, if, if aggression is hardwired into us, if it's something we're born with, where does it exist? How does it work, biologically speaking? And these things are important because often understanding how something works can tell us very important things about why it happens and why it doesn't happen. So for example, if we're all born with this instinct to be aggressive, why is it that some people seem to be more willing to express it or more likely to indulge that instinct than others? Why do some people seem to have their aggression under better control than others? And the instinctive explanation doesn't tell us anything that can help answer those questions. So these days, although the idea that we might be in some way innately aggressive or have some, that aggression might have a biological component, that hasn't gone away. And you'll see there are now sort of um, ways of expressing this with more detail and more insight. We don't really talk about instincts anymore. We talk about it in other ways. One of the ways in which we might learn something about the, the biological or innate elements of aggression might be to compare uh, human aggression with aggression in other animals. Uh, 
before you sort of um, listen to the rest of the slide, I recommend uh, following the link on the, the bottom of the page there to a YouTube presentation which shows uh, a short clip from a documentary about two uh, rams engaging in a competition, a sort of a ritual fight that exists between male rams uh, around about the time that they are um, about to breed. So watch the video first. If you can't find this video, I'm sure you'll be able to find other ones like it about sort of animals competing for mates or competing in order to win a mate in order to reproduce. Watch that first, pause the recording, come back to me. If you've had a chance to look at the recording of animals competing, male animals competing to win a mate, on the surface this would seem to support the instinctive explanation that you know aggression seems to be built into animals including man and that therefore there must be something biological in it. However any comparison between human beings and other animals often highlights as much the differences that exist between our behaviour and theirs as the similarities. On the surface yes here are two members of the same species fighting which we could say draw we can think of parallels of human beings fighting each other and similarly if you look at documentary or footage of animals attacking other species to for food again there seems to be parallels there that human beings might attack other or kill other animals or show aggression towards other animals for the same reasons to defend themselves against attackers or for food what's interesting though is that in each of the cases of aggression for animals we we can see very specific purposes there are uh, Lorenz called them releasers reasons why those animals are aggressive under those circumstances uh, now in terms of animals being aggressive towards other species the reasons are typically um, to defend themselves again or their offspring against an attacker or, or to secure food or in defense of a territory these these tend to be reasons and if the reason isn't there the animal will not be aggressive man is slightly different in that man occasionally expresses aggression towards other species for without needing it without having any of these reasons um, so we we hunt for sport and sometimes we simply are cruel or aggressive towards animals without having any good reason obviously or any obvious reason but I think it's when you look at man's aggression towards his own species what they call intra-species aggression that we really see a big difference between um, animal aggression and human aggression if you saw the, the video that the link is there too you'll have seen the two rams fighting and there's a couple of things that the, the narrator mentioned which are very common features of intra-species aggression in animals. Firstly, there are very specific times and places where it happens. It's always for very specific reasons, usually uh, as a competition in order to secure the best mate for reproduction. There are rituals to it, signals which both parties use which are very clear and unambiguous that aggression is about to happen and both parties are willing participants they they choose to participate in the in the aggression um, and very importantly the aggression is almost always done in a way that avoids injury to either party I mean in the in the the rams if you saw that video their entire biology is designed not just to avoid injury to themselves but also to avoid injuring the other party they don't their horns curl inwards rather than point outwards so as to as a uh, product of evolution so that there are fewer uh, fatalities fewer injuries as a result of these competitions and that makes sense because effectively if you if every time rams or animals like this com competed for mates that one of them were to end up dead it would end up being very bad for the species to have so many fatalities and as a result the species would not do well it would not thrive and so evolution has effectively produced a form of combat and produced a physicality in the animals 
that avoids this so that you have more people survive, more of the members of their species surviving. Now you compare all this to intraspecies and human beings and it's a completely different story. We don't have any universally agreed signals or times or places when aggression takes place. We find it very difficult often to know when aggression is going to happen and sometimes it will happen with only one party wanting the aggression to occur and the other party not wanting to take part at all. And also, and this one has been pointed out by more than just psychologists, man is one of the few animals out there that will actually kill its own species. Um, so this says to us that there, there's something very different about aggression in man. Um, and although there may be some common features between human aggression and aggression in other animals, the differences are far more telling, far more interesting to us. But we'll get on to those a little bit later. For the moment, one of the parallels we can see here is the link between aggression and reproduction. That uh, in animals, ag aggression, intraspecies aggression towards their own species is almost always linked to a, with reproduction in some way. And this often links it with specific elements, biological elements of reproduction like testosterone. And raises the question, might the same elements be at play in human aggression? Is there any evidence that testosterone might be a factor in explaining human aggression in the same way it explains aggression in other animals? This, the comparison uh, between human behaviour and animals has, as I said, given rise to an interest in whether or not testosterone has a part to play in aggression, since certainly in animals there seems to be a direct link between uh, intraspecies aggression when they fight amongst themselves and reproduction, so that um, male animals will often enter in these kind of uh, bouts of combat or mock combat in order to determine who's dominant and who gets first choice of the, uh, the available females. A number of studies have attempted to see if there's any relationship between testosterone and aggression in men, in human men, in the same way. Uh, or in human women it should be added because testosterone is not unique to men it exists in both men and women it just tends to be in higher levels in men the research has found that generally speaking there doesn't seem to be any direct relationship between testosterone levels and aggression so that uh, there doesn't seem to be higher levels of testosterone um, linked to aggression in, in men or women and the higher levels of testosterone in men don't seem to explain uh, any gender differences there might be in aggression. We'll come back to gender differences later or any differences within each gender in levels of aggression. So men with higher levels of testosterone don't tend to be more aggressive than men with lower levels of testosterone. Um, so the the idea that testosterone itself might be the, the cause of aggression or levels of testosterone is not supported by the research. Um, however there may be a more specific way to look at this that if you attempt to link testosterone with all forms of aggression you don't find a relationship however when they've looked at people who have committed serious crimes there doesn't tend to be higher levels of testosterone in these individuals compared to the the rest of the population if the crimes are non-sexual so uh, robbery or even assault uh, in a, in a non-sexual scenario however for those individuals who have committed serious crimes related to some aspect of uh, sex, so uh, rape or murder relating to, to sex, there does tend to be a significant difference in those individuals compared to the rest of the population. They do seem to have uh, higher levels of testosterone in comparison to the rest of the population. So what this suggests is that there might be a, a biological, specifically a, a hormonal element on, in sexual aggression. Uh, and that effectively uh, the, the hormone itself might be a predictor of sexual aggression. However, we should be very careful not to assume that it is a causal relationship. What they found is that there are higher levels of testosterone in those individuals who commit serious sexual crimes. This does not mean that it's their higher levels of testosterone that are causing them to commit these crimes, nor does it mean that the higher levels of that the crimes are causing them to have higher levels of testosterone. All we know is that a higher level of testosterone is a predictor or is associated with 
those who commit serious sex crimes. Um, it's possible that there might be a third factor which might explain both their commission of sex crimes and their higher levels of testosterone. So we should just be careful on um, what conclusions we draw here. In short then, there, there isn't a convincing case made that testosterone is the cause or the origin of aggression in males, irrespective of what kind of aggression that is, but it is a predictor of uh, certain kinds of sexual aggression. If hormones, if testosterone isn't the answer, what might be? What other alternatives do we have? These days, of course, genetics tend to be the, uh, the biological explanation of choice for almost anything you can imagine. And as we begin to map the human genome, there's been uh, an interest or an attempt to identify a genetic component to almost everything and anything that we do. There have even been genes which have been loosely associated with levels of aggression. Uh, sometimes the media picks up on these and popularizes them or even sort of, uh, you know, gives them a, a very dramatic quality. You hear people talking about uh, warrior genes or uh, killer psych psychopath genes. Uh, as being, uh, in their view, an explanation for the, the aggressive behaviour of these individuals. There's something we should be uh, aware of, that no matter how consistently they find uh, certain genetic markers in individuals who have been shown considerably higher levels of aggression than the, the rest of the population, we shouldn't make the mistake of assuming that that therefore means that their genes are causing them to act in this way. Now, as well as the same issue that we had with the testosterone, that simply um, because two things go together, it doesn't prove that one is causing the other. There's another separate um, thing to consider here, which is that genes don't directly affect our behavior. Your genes in no way pull the strings on your day-to-day -day behavior, cause you to act one way or cause you to act another. That's not how genes, that's not the role that genes play at all in our behaviour, any kind of behaviour. So <clears throat> the assumption that simply because somebody has a genetic, certain genetic pattern, that this genetic pattern is going to cause them to act in any way, say in an aggressive fa fashion, is completely misunderstanding the way genes work. Let's look at, there are certain steps that have to exist between the genetic pattern and the behaviour for those genes to affect the behaviour. And let's look at that in the specific case of aggression. How might a certain pattern of genetic markers end up affecting us in a way that might eventually affect our behaviour? And once you see that, you'll understand better the, the role that genetics can play in any behaviour, including aggression. As I've said before, the role of the genes is not to sort of pull the strings on our day-to-day behaviour. The, the primary purpose of our genetic pattern is as a blueprint for our physical development as we grow, as we mature. So the genes represent the blueprint for you and how you will develop and grow, what colour your eyes will be, what colour your hair will be, what height you will have, and other, a thousand other small variations that exist within you uh, as an individual growing up, physical variations. Now, one of the most influential areas that can be changed as a result of genetics is the development of our brain, our brain structures, although we will all end up with roughly the same brain structure. It will never be exactly the same. There will be subtle differences between your brain structure and mine. It may be something as, as invisible as how active certain parts of your brain are, how reactive they are. Um, for example, the brain produces a chemical, or chemicals rather, called neurotransmitters, which is how the brain effectively sends signals through itself uh, and that all our brain activity is a combination of neurons firing and releasing neurochemicals to activate other neurons which fire and create these sort of patterns of activation in our brain which represent how we think and react and move and act. Now, the neurotransmitters are an important part of this process and our brain releases them and then has to make new ones, has to generate new ones in order to release them again to keep functioning. So effectively you could think of it as a, like our brain sending little sort of letters to itself or to different parts of itself passing messages along. It then has to create more letters to release again the next time. And this is known as a, sort of the turnover of neurotransmitters, releasing them and then 
constructing new ones out of the materials that we get from our food and our uh, other uh, other things that we ingest. And your brain has to be fairly effective at doing this, at creating new neurotransmitters to release over and over again throughout the day as it remains active. Now, if your brain is not very good at manufacturing certain kinds of neurotransmitter, it can have an effect on our behavior. Uh, so effectively, if the brain doesn't generate neurotransmitters rapidly enough, certain kinds of brain function will be affected. And there's a particular neurotransmitter, serotonin, which seems to be very necessary in certain parts of the brain, called the limbic system, which is a series of structures in the brain that are involved in regulating emotion. And essentially these parts of the brain seem to help us to keep our emotions under control. And if they're not, so they act as almost like brakes on a car to sort of slow us down and stop our emotions getting, stop us getting uh, carried away with our emotions. Now if this part of the brain isn't working effectively, it's like the brakes on the car not working effectively, the car doesn't slow down quickly enough and you can end up getting into a crash. Now, emotionally that means that we may not keep our emotions under control and they may, we may get carried away with them. And if you think about losing your temper, well, that's very much like not you, you not being able to sort of manage your emotions effectively. Now, the reason why certain people might have a less effective limbic system not working as efficiently as the rest of us could be genetic. And so there's one explanation that's been put forward, and I'm, I don't think this has been yet fully kind of proven in the research, but it's been proposed, is that people with certain genetic structures might have, uh, might be more likely to have a limbic system that isn't working properly. It's not guaranteed, but it's more likely with these people. And therefore, they may be less effective at managing their emotions and therefore may be more likely to be aggressive because they're unable to control uh, their aggressive impulses. So this shows you that effectively the way that something like DNA could affect behavior, it's very indirect and there's lots of maybes there. The DNA structure may lead to the limbic system not developing correctly. But I only say may because there are lots of things that affect our brain development, not just our genetics. Uh, things we're exposed to prenatally in the womb, but also our diet. Um, events that occur during our childhood, uh, even our adulthood, can affect our brain development. So the genetics is just one of the factors that affects brain development. And it may be the genetics on their own aren't enough to produce a poorly functioning limbic system. Similarly, the limbic system is very complicated. And so just because there's a, a drop in its effectiveness, it's not guaranteed that we will be bad at managing our emotions. It's just one of the ways in which we manage them. And therefore, it's possible that even somebody with a less than ideally functioning limbic system might still be able to manage their emotions in other ways, and therefore not likely to, to result in more aggressive behaviour. All of this shows that genetics can have an impact on our behaviour, but it's not a direct one, and they are simply one factor in many which can affect our behaviour in this way. Um, another factor, as I've said, is diet. And there have been studies which have suggested that if serotonin, the production of serotonin and the, the sort of um, turnover of serotonin is an important part of managing emotion, what if there were elements of our diet which also affect serotonin, would they affect uh, our, the level of over, um, turnover of this neurotransmitter and thus affect our aggression? And that's what we're going to look at next. Indeed, this, this very question about the relationship between certain kinds of diet and serotonin and aggression has been looked at in a number of places. Most interestingly, they've looked at it in relation to the consumption of soft drinks, because in um, essentially low-fat soft drinks, which try to use less sugar, they tend to replace it with an artificial sweetener called aspartame. And there has been um, some suggestions that aspartame might inhibit serotonin production or serotonin release so that it might actually prevent our brain from using serotonin as effectively as it should. And if that's the case, it raises the possibility that if you're someone who drinks lots of these uh, low-fat soft drinks with all this artificial sweetener in it, that you might then have problems managing your emotions. There was a very large study done on this, um, which you're seeing there, the, uh, the study in uh, 2013. Uh, done by uh, Sulia Solnik and Hemingway, 
and they looked at a group of five-year-olds with behavioural problems and tried to establish how much these individuals, uh, the children, were consuming soft drinks in comparison to, to others. So they checked with the mothers and asked them on a typical day how many sodas, servings of soda does your child drink? That's no, soda because it's an American uh, group, of course. And um, the, the study didn't just look at their soda consumption, it looked at other things they were doing, like uh, time watching television, sort of any incidents of, of depression or, or violence within the home, you know. And they found that when they controlled all the other factors they looked at, uh, soda consumption or consumption of soft drinks was correlated with uh, examples of uh, aggressive behaviour. So aggressive behaviour was, was twice more likely in those children who consumed four or more um, cans of soda in a day. Now on the surface again, this appears to be evidence supporting the idea that uh, you know serotonin is affecting aggression and these drinks are affecting serotonin, therefore the drinks are the reason these children are more aggressive. However, um, there's a, there were a couple of issues with this study. I mean, obviously they, they weren't actually measuring the actual amount of uh, soft drinks that kids were consuming. They were relying on the mother's recollection, which is often uh, a little bit hazy, both in terms of how much soft drinks the child was consuming and how much aggressive behaviour the child was exhibiting. On both cases, we're, they were using the mother's recollections, which are not likely to be 100% accurate. Um, they also uh, didn't consider, although they tried to control for certain other factors which might explain the same thing, there were a number they didn't look like. Um, so they, they looked at like incidences of uh, sort of depression in the family but they didn't consider whether or not the children might have themselves have behavioural issues like ADHD um, or other things which might explain their behaviour. And also, we have to remember, as we did with the, the testosterone, that simply because soda consumption was higher in the kids who were more aggressive, it doesn't mean that the soda consumption caused the aggression. There could be a third factor which explained both of them. For example, it may be that the, the parents who were very uh, lax on discipline you know, rarely attempted to control or guide the behaviour of their child would be more likely to allow their child to consume lots of soft drinks and also tolerate a lot more uh, aggressive behaviour and so the two might go together not because they're causing each other but because a third factor, the, the parental style of the parent is, is causing both of them. As such, other studies which have attempted to directly test the relationship between sugar and aspartame and uh, aggression haven't found a link between them. Uh, so for example the, the, the Cruci et al study that I'm showing you there was a, a double blind study where basically rather than asking the same people how much soft drinks were the children consuming and how aggressive were they, they essentially monitored the soft drink consumption by the children themselves, the, the researchers did, but then asked a, a separate group of people to rate the children's behaviour without telling them, those people how many soft drinks the child had consumed. And they found that the ratings of the children's behaviour didn't have any relationship with the, uh, the number of soft drinks consumed. So uh, levels of, of uh, sort of sucrose and glucose or aspartame, all the things you find in soft drinks, were not even correlated with aggressive behaviour. Um, and even more interesting, there was another study done by um, a group of researchers who rather than looking at a natural level of, of aspartame consumption, which you have to do in humans, they took a group of rats and artificially gave them increasing doses of aspartame. Now what they found, which is very interesting, was that the increased doses of aspartame did reduce serotonin production. So the rats that got the larger doses did have lower levels of serotonin in their brain. But this produced less aggression, not more. Now serotonin is likely to do a similar job in the rat's brain as it does in ours, but reducing it didn't produce more aggression as we would, as we thought it would, or as they thought it would, because uh, previous studies have suggested so. Now this paradoxical result is not uncommon in studies of brain chemistry where sometimes reducing or increasing the level of a neurotransmitter does not have the effect that's expected. And this is because neurotransmitters are incredibly complex things. They do the same neurotransmitter does dozens of different jobs in the brain. Serotonin is not just involved in one type of behaviour, it's involved in dozens. And so 
when we look at reductions in serotonin, we're going to see lots of changes in behavior which are going to affect each other as well. And so that the effect between, or the relationship between the neurotransmitter and the behavior is never a simple one. Um, unfortunately, this leaves us with a less clear situation than before. It suggests that uh, the way that genetics might affect, or even that neurotransmitters might affect aggressive behavior is very unclear. Um, and in fact, uh, it may be that uh, the same thing, dropping serotonin levels, might have two completely opposite effects on the same behavior. It might increase aggressive behavior in other way, some ways and decrease it in others. For this reason, I tend to favor um, social explanations for aggressive behavior over biological ones. I feel the, the evidence for the biological explanations is not compelling. There are some links here, and I think there's more to be understood about the biological elements in, in causing um, as, or as an origin of aggressive behavior, but what we're seeing at the moment doesn't provide us with anything really strong. Let's consider the social explanations, the social origins of aggressive behavior now. To understand the way in which our socialization might affect our levels of aggression, you really have to look at something like social learning theory, Bandura and others have uh, popularized as a way of explaining our, our social learning. That in fact we don't have to learn everything directly, through our own experiences we can observe the behavior of others and learn from their experiences. And aggression is one of the things that we learn in this way. So it's suggested that if our role models, the people whose behavior has the biggest impact on our own behavior, if we observe them being aggressive and that aggression in some way benefiting them, then we, we learn aggression as a thing you should do. Now, of course, we don't simply learn from anybody's aggression. Often parents get very panicky that children are going to imitate everything and everyone they see. But in truth, children and everybody else are, are quite selective on who are their role models, who do they look up to. So, um, for example, they tend to focus mainly on people who are very uh, involved in their life, that have a direct role often in nurturing them, uh, and that uh, people who influence not just us, but everyone around us, that have an effect on the people we know. Uh, we, we, we are very influenced by people who seem to be in charge of the people we know and their, our life around us, and people that we feel that we have some similarity to. Now, when you look at that checklist, every single one of those points towards the parents as the biggest and most important role models we can have. And not surprisingly, when we look at children who come from homes where there is aggression expressed by the parents, either towards the children or towards each other, you know, in the case of uh, conflict between the, the parents, these children are much more likely to show aggressive behavior and much less likely to show sympathy for, for other children who are in distress. And that's a recipe for essentially learning to be aggressive. Um, so there's a, a very strong social impact in terms of how we're brought up. And not just the lessons we're deliberately taught, but the lessons we see by observing the behavior of our parents and in their everyday lives around us. Uh, of course, parents are not the only role models we have out there, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. One of the interesting things about learning aggression this way, socially learning it, is that aggression isn't, not, isn't necessarily learned in the same way by uh, children of both genders, and that's what I want to look at next. Before we go further with this slide, uh, it's well worth you um, having a look at the video footage there on, on YouTube, um, which is footage of the actual original study by Bandura, narrated, I think, by Bandura himself. And it talks about what the study tried to do. So have a look at that first, um, hoping, assuming the link is still active, hopefully. Um, if not, you might simply want to search for uh, sort of Bandura and social learning theory, and you're likely to find a similar footage, if not the same one. Have a look at that first, then come back to play the rest of this uh, section of the, the presentation. Okay, so you've had a hopefully had a look at the Bandura footage now, and what you should have seen there is that um, Bandura essentially allowed the children to watch a video uh, of some an adult playing with some toys, and particularly uh, playing with one particular toy, uh, the Bobo doll of the, the title of the experiment, which is a sort of an inflatable doll that if you knock over it, it sort of self-writes itself, and so you can knock it over again. 
and they sometimes saw the the adult they always saw the the adult acting in a in an aggressive manner toward this doll but sometimes they saw the the adult being praised or rewarded in some way for that behavior other times they saw the adult or a different group saw the adult being punished or criticized for that behavior and a third group saw uh, no consequences, neither rewards or punishments for the adult's behaviour. They then allowed the children to play with similar toys to see if the children would imitate the behaviour of the adult and essentially learn the behaviour from what they'd seen. And the behaviours were quite distinctive in order to show that these were behaviours children had learned from the adult and not something they'd learned somewhere else. So they were sort of unusual behaviours that would make it clear that children was, it were imitating specifically what they'd previously seen. Now. Uh, What's interesting, there's two things, you, know, you can see the results here summarised in, a, in, a, in the bar chart. A, a higher bar means uh, more likely uh, that the child responded in the same way as, as the, the model, the, the adult they were seeing. Now there's a few things to, uh, to compare here. First, it's interesting to compare the different conditions. And it's interesting to note that the condition where they saw the adult rewarded is the most likely, the condition in which they're most likely to imitate it. But closely followed by no consequences at all. So it seems that it's not just when we see the behavior rewarded, but I guess when we don't see any kind of punishments that we uh, may be encouraged to imitate and try it ourselves. And it's only really when the, the children saw the behavior punished that they were less likely to engage in the behavior themselves. So that, I think, shows us some important things to consider about showing violence or letting, letting children be able, you know, witness any kind of violence or aggression, that it's important that consequences are discussed and not simply left ambiguous. But the other interesting thing to note is if you compare the, the green and red, or well, green and pink uh, bars, which the green ones being the, the boys and the pink ones being the, the girls, is that um, in every condition the boys are much more likely to imitate aggression than the girls are. Now it's not accidental that um, they chose aggression or that they compared the genders, they, they were expecting to find uh, a difference um, because they, there was previous studies which had found that parents were more likely to encourage gender appropriate behaviour and therefore children were more likely to, to imitate gender appropriate behaviour that they saw. And since aggression was and still is to a certain degree considered to be a more male behaviour, the expectations of the researchers, uh, which were borne out by what they found, was that the boys would be more likely to imitate what they saw, because they would be uh, more likely to see that behaviour as acceptable for boys to do. And not surprisingly, the boys were more likely to imitate the behaviour they saw than the girls were. Um, which shows that w it's another factor we consider when it comes to imitation, not just the rewards or punishments that we witness the, the person, the model, experiencing, but also whether or not the behaviour itself is one that we consider to be appropriate in some way to ourselves, to our gender, to society in general. And the more likely we consider it to be appropriate behaviour, the more likely we're going to imitate it. One question which might be popping into your mind, I know it occurred to me, was whether or not the gender of the person being observed mattered. Did it matter if they were seeing a, a, a male adult uh, engage in the behaviour or a female one? Were the boys more likely to imitate the man? Were the girls more likely to imitate the woman? Uh, we often think about this when we talk about role models, don't we? You know, uh, uh, the importance of a male role model or the importance of a female role model. Well, what, what part did that play here? Mm, that's the next thing I'd like to look at. The design of the study tried to explore this question directly. They uh, deliberately had half the groups witness uh, a male role model and half the groups witness a female role model in all three conditions, in the reward condition, the punishment condition and the no consequences condition. And so that way they were able to compare the, the, the children's level of imitation, their learning, from a male role model and a female one and they were able to look also more specifically at the level of imitation from boys witnessing a male role model to boys witnessing a female one and similarly girls witnessing a male one and girls witnessing a female one. What they expected to find was that the boys would be more likely to imitate the, the male role model. They weren't sure whether or not the, the girls would be more likely to imitate the male role model as well because it was a male behaviour, aggression, or if they'd be more likely to imitate the female role model because the female role model is more similar to them. And remember similarity is one of the things that makes us more likely to treat somebody as a role model. 
So theoretically, because the, the man is more similar to the boys, they sh it should be more likely the man is a role model or more of a role model than a woman would be. Interestingly, the results didn't bear out any of this. They, they didn't find any significant difference between boys or girls witnessing a male role model versus boys or girls witnessing a female role model. So it seems that the gender of the role model didn't uh, make it more likely for the children of the same gender to imitate that role model. And so I guess when it comes to witnessing aggression, it seems that uh, both boys and girls are just as likely to learn from witnessing a woman exhibiting aggressive behaviour as they are from a man exhibiting aggressive behaviour, as long as that person is a role model. One thing that was interesting, although the statistics didn't find any difference, there is some anecdotal evidence that the children themselves believed in certain differences or, or had a certain viewpoints uh, on men versus women being aggressive. And this would support the idea that the children were aware that aggression was a gendered behaviour. So although they were just as likely to learn from men or women being aggressive, they were more likely to approve of the male role model being aggressive and more likely to disapprove of the female role model being aggressive. So there are, there, there are comments with the researchers recorded the children saying. Uh, so for example, uh, the children were disapproving of female role models being aggressive. Uh, they, they were saying things like, that's not a way for a lady to behave. Ladies are supposed to act like ladies. So they know that aggression is a gendered behaviour and that it's not appropriate for women, which is possibly why the girls were less likely to imitate in general than the boys. They knew it was inappropriate for them. But it's interesting that the boys, both boys and girls, thought aggression was more acceptable for men. So there were, there were comments like, he's a good fighter, like daddy, which is a scary thing to think about when you consider the child is talking about their actual father. Yeah, I think my daddy's a great fighter. It means they're seeing their daddy doing enough fighter to develop enough fighting to develop that opinion, which is a scary thought. But uh, again, it shows that the children are aware of gender as a uh, uh, aware of aggression as a gender behaviour, and that this is probably explaining why they are more or less likely to imitate it depending on their own gender. Of course, our expectations, our, our gender norms about aggression, don't go away when we stop being children and grow up. In fact, if anything, they become more well established. And uh, it's worth reflecting on your own gender norms about aggression and considering where, where they came from and, and what they actually mean to you. I mean, consider the scenarios on the, the screen here. It's going to be hard to avoid sort of second guessing yourself now that I've raised it as an issue that you might have learned these as norms. But see if you can find your natural response in there before you sort of your, your second guess kicks in. So if yesterday or the day before I'd asked you, is it acceptable if a woman slaps a man for a man to slap her back, I would expect that most of you would say that was not acceptable. Um, now if I asked you why it wasn't acceptable, you might have difficulty putting it into words. It's just wrong for men to hit women. That's what we've always learned as we grow up. And you may have tried to explain it to yourself in some way that say, oh well, it's because men are generally stronger. So it's, it's wrong for a bigger person to uh, hit a smaller person or a stronger person to hit a weaker person because uh, they're so much stronger that it's not a fair fight. But interestingly, that same logic doesn't crop up if you were to ask the exact same people who said a man shouldn't hit a woman back. But if a small man picks a fight with a big man and starts shoving him or hitting him, is it okay for the big man to fight back? Most people would say, yeah, that's okay. Because really, it's not about strength. That's just a way we've in invented to rationalize it to ourselves, to make sense of it to ourselves, that it's, it's not a gender issue, it's something to do with strength. It's not. If it were two men who were fighting and a small man started it, picked the fight, we would think it was acceptable for the bigger man to fight back because it's okay for men to fight, especially but only if they're fighting other men. Whereas if a woman picks a fight with a man by slapping him or shoving him, we don't think it's acceptable for a man to fight back. And it's not a strength issue, that's just a way we've invented to make sense of it to ourselves. We just fundamentally feel it's wrong because that's what we were taught that men should not hit women under any circumstances. Um, I think it's even more interesting that this, this norm still exists in a world where women are increasingly able to achieve comparable physical strength to many men, and that the idea that all women are inherently weaker is itself just as much a stereotype 
as the, the idea that it's, it's always wrong for a man to hit a woman. It's also interesting to note that this, this kind of um, disapproval of aggression tends to only apply to physical aggression. So the scenario you have in the lower part of the slide where you ask people which is worse um, to deliberately not invite somebody to a party or to stand at the door of the party and physically block them from getting in, which is more aggressive. I would say the vast majority of people would say the second one is more aggressive. Now in either way you're preventing them from going to the party, you're deliberately trying to exclude them as a way of hurting them, as a way of um, you know, hurting their feelings or basically getting them, getting at them. But we consider the, the, the one where we physically shove them away to be aggression, whereas the other one we would consider that to be rudeness or nastiness or pettiness, but we wouldn't necessarily call it aggression. And this comes back to that definition I talked to you about near the start of the session, where we tend to still limit ourselves to seeing aggression as in physical terms. And this is one of the reasons we t still think of aggression as a male thing, because we're only thinking about physical aggression, and physical aggression is generally more a male characteristic, men tend to engage in physical aggression more, which is probably why we continue to consider aggression to be a gendered thing, and therefore and thus a male thing. So if you want to understand why we, even in the modern day, continue to maintain this view that gender is a more male thing than a female thing, it's because we still tend to define gender in physical terms, and we tend to treat examples of physical um, aggression as aggression, whereas we don't tend to characterize psychological aggression as aggression, we tend to call it something else. And this is one of the ways that we maintain the idea that aggression is a male thing. Because originally studies showed, or appeared to show, that aggression was more common in males. But when they reviewed the studies at a later point, they realized that the only aggression those studies were looking at was physical aggression. And that once you started to include other forms of aggression, the gender differences disappeared. So it's now generally considered that there is no difference between men and women in terms of their level of aggression, that they show roughly the same. On average, men are as aggressive as women are, and women are as aggressive as men are. But that there's a gender difference in how they express that aggression. Men are more likely to express their aggression physically. Uh, and it's, it's often related to issues of dominance or control whereas women are more likely to express their aggression emotionally or psychologically and it's more about sort of relationships with others that the aggression is being used to affect. So what this tells us is that actually aggression is not a male thing. It is true that physical aggression is a male thing but there's a sort of a chicken and an egg question here. Is physical aggression a male thing because males have grown up believing that that's the only kind of aggression that they're permitted to show, that that's, that's the masculine way to deal with aggression. And similarly, is physical aggression less likely in women because, again, they've grown up being told that that's the way that women express their aggression and it's not acceptable for them to express their aggression any other way. All this shows us is that aggression and how we express it does differ across genders, but those differences could be largely, if not entirely, a product of our socialization, the way we're raised, and the gender norms that we're raised into, the expectations of our gender, and how our gender is supposed to behave. I said earlier that uh, in terms of role models, it's very hard to find one that's going to be as influential as our parents, simply because they, they just for almost all of us, the parents are the, the, the ones that tick all the boxes in terms of what makes some, somebody like to be a role model, nurturance, dominance, influence, and, and similarity, and other factors as well. Of course, simply because they are the biggest influence doesn't mean that they are the only influence that counts. There are many other influences on our behaviours, all kinds of behaviours, and that includes aggression. So I've listed here on the, on the screen, in no particular order, the various people that can be role models to us uh, as we grow up and even in our adult life we shouldn't assume that role models are only relevant to us when we're kids.
parents are there, of course, as are our friends and people we go to school with, people we live in the same neighborhood as. Again, we shouldn't assume that everybody we know is going to be a role model. It's going to be some of these people, generally the ones that are more similar to us, that uh, we perceive to be more dominant, uh, all the other things that we look for when I mentioned our parents. Now, I'm going to focus in on one other specific role model or potential role model for aggressive behaviour, and that's uh, video games. And I'm picking this one particularly because um, it's often, at the moment, it's a bit of a hot topic about levels of uh, violence in video games and whether or not playing these games can have a, an impact on uh, the people who play them, on the, specifically on the children who play them. Does it lead the children to become more aggressive? Does it lead the children to become more, if you like, um, immune to, to sort of or uh, accepting of aggression, that they, they become used to it and are more likely to, to sort of uh, become desensitised to it, I guess, is the way that's often described. Let's, let's consider that. What evidence is there to support this idea that playing video games with violence in them or aggression in them might uh, have an effect uh, on the children in terms of being a role model for the children's own aggressive behaviour? If you're a parent with children who play computers, and almost all children do these days, um, this may have been something you've worried about yourself. And, or if you're uh, younger and aren't so far out of the days from you know, when you were able to spend hours plunked in front of a computer playing video games, then this may have been something your parents worried about for you. Uh, I would say for me <laughs> it is both. I am both a parent who occasionally wonders about this issue and I'm pretty sure that given the amount of time I spent on a computer when I was growing up, uh, it was probably something my parents worried about too. Now there are a lot of studies out there and sometimes as parents it's hard to know what the, 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 the general agreement is, what's the consensus on this. Different studies seem to have different results and often what you need is someone to take a, an overview, look at a, look the, the broad st strokes of the brush, look at, across all the different studies to see if there's any agreement, any consensus. Now rather Usefully, um, the, back in 2008 and 2010, the, the UK government of the time commissioned uh, a review, uh, what's called a meta-analysis, of a large number of the studies that have been carried out up to that date. And this review was led by uh, uh, Tanya Bryan, who was a, a psychologist and psychiatrist, uh, very active in the media, but also um, reasonably well respected. And so a good person to lead a team to review the research out there to see what the research was telling us in terms of the, the level of aggression found in games but also the impact that aggression was likely to have on people who played them. Now one of the interesting things of the f findings of the um, review was that actually the, the number of games out there that were considered to have uh, real violence in them was quite small. It was really a only a very small percentage, about 6% of games, had a sort of an 18s rating, which would suggest that they were violent or aggressive, and less than 20% even had a 14 or 15s rating. So the idea that the, the entire games industry was full of nothing but violent video games or a majority of violent video games is certainly not the case. But what about um, the, the impact that there might be on the children who play the, the few games out there that are violent or that, that show violence? Um, now, interestingly, there, there was, the, reviewing all the different studies that have been carried out, they found that generally speaking, there were a good number of studies which found a short-term correlational effect. Now remember what I said earlier about correlation, it doesn't mean causing, it just means that there was slightly higher levels of aggression in children who played uh, the games compared to those who didn't. But, of course, it's not clear if um, playing the game itself was the reason the, the certain children were more aggressive. It simply it could easily be that being more aggressive they sought out more aggressive games, or it could be a third factor which caused them to be more aggressive and to, f to seek out the games. What was interesting is that even those studies that found a relationship, it was generally a short-term thing. That generally speaking, while there might be an immediately higher level of aggression in the individuals who play the games that this quickly went away and very soon their levels of aggression were no different from the rest of the population. Um, the, there was also a lot of evidence to support the idea that children were very capable of distinguishing between fantasy and reality and that's often one of the fears about violent video games that they'll think 
they'll start to blur the lines between the game and real life and think that that's how they should act in real life or that's how people act in real life. Whereas uh, research which actually explored this question found that no kids were very capable of differentiating between what you do in real life and what you do in a video game. Um, they also found that um, there was a possibility that playing aggressive or violent video games might actually um, reduce levels of aggression, sort of the idea of blowing off steam. Um, so that, uh, you know, it might actually be the case that potentially playing a, a, a game in which you were able to be aggressive might result in less aggression, not more. Um, there was, there's no evidence there that there was any desensitization, that the that playing these games led the children to be more uncaring um, about their, their, their fellow man or about the suffering of others. In fact, a lot of the research out there found that, generally speaking, the, the effects of playing the games could be positive, both in terms of cognitive development, uh, perception, decision-making, problem-solving, but even a little bit of impulse control, that children who played the games often learned from the game to, to be patient and wait for things because the game required them to be patient in order to win it. And patience is a skill which can be as useful in controlling aggression as anything else. Um, there was a suggestion that the children's interpretation of what they saw was important. That if we were interested in actually reducing aggression, that games could be used in this way, but that it was important for the, somebody to discuss with the children the, the, what they were seeing and what it meant and what lessons were there. And so what this was an argument for was the, the parents to get involved, that if the parents wanted to use violent video games to help, if you like, teach the children lessons about violence and about aggression, that this could be done, but the parents needed to get involved rather than trying to ban the games or keep them at arm's length. Um, I think that there's a possibility that violent video games might simply be the, 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 the moral panic of the day. Uh, and if you're interested in moral panic, it's worth looking it up as a, as a theory, a sociological theory. Um, that occasionally parents simply get very, very worried about certain, aspect of certain aspects of youth culture. And, uh, you know, in the past, this might have been comic books or rock and roll or rap music or uh, heavy metal um, or raves or these days, potentially uh, uh, violent video games or, you know, uh, religious indoctrination. There's almost always something that tends to be very much at the centre of parents' worry radar, and it may be that the, their concerns about video games were simply a reflection of that. Um, it's likely to be more of a problem previously for generations of parents that grew up without video games themselves, and so find it hard to relate to them. And it's interesting that parents of that generation are, were more likely to be concerned about video games than they were about, say, children becoming, you know, with their nose always buried in a book that somehow the idea that video games would have only negative consequences and not recognise any of the positive ones, whereas a child with his nose buried in the book might also have negative consequences in terms of their social development, but the parents could relate to this more and so were less concerned about it than a video game. What this tells us is that overall there doesn't seem to be a lot to be concerned about in terms of video games having a negative effect or increasing incidences of violence or aggression by children or making them desensitized. But instead, it shows us that video games might offer us an opportunity to actually teach children some positive lessons in relation to a lot of things, including aggression like impulse control. And by getting involved, or as parents, we can um, discuss with the children what they're seeing and therefore actually use the game as a positive lesson uh, in terms of uh, aggression rather than worrying about it being a negative one. This may be a good time for you to take a break uh, in this uh, presentation. It's been going for some time now and you're likely to be sort of flagging a little bit. So you should pause the recording at this point, take 15 minutes of a break, have some refreshments, just get away from this for a few minutes and uh, then come back again when you're ready to start and continue with it. And we'll move on to the second area that we're going to look at, which are the specific causes for or triggers for aggression on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but before we break, just to summarise what we've, we've seen so far. So 
overall we've learned that there are different kinds of aggression more than we might have originally appreciated in terms of physical uh, versus psychological aggression we've learned that it's difficult to identify direct parallels between human aggression and animal aggression we've learned that the, the biological explanations and dietary explanations are not very strong in terms of their ability to predict aggressive behavior the, they have some validity but uh, not as important it would appear as uh, social influences and that um, in terms of our social influences we do seem to learn aggression from the the most important role models we're exposed to and that tends to be our parents and they tend to be one of the biggest but not the only uh, role model when it comes to learning aggression and that that learning may be gendered and that we might learn certain kinds of aggression which are appropriate for or believe, seem to be appropriate for our gender and that this might change how we express aggression but not necessarily the overall levels of aggression that we express. Now pause the recording, take a short break and then when you come back we'll move on to the next section. Okay, so up until now we've been considering the, the origins of aggression, where aggression might come from in general uh, in human beings. Now look at some, let's look at more specific question of what are the particular factors or events that might cause a particular example of aggressive behaviour or what might trigger us to be aggressive on a particular occasion. In order to consider what are the likely causes of aggression, it's well worth considering just for a moment what is it that makes you angry. Even if you're a very placid person, even if you rarely lose your temper or never lose your temper, Unless you're an absolute saint or an emotionless robot, there's, there's chances are certain things which get you a little bit hot and bothered, a little bit tetchy or a little bit on edge. What are they? What causes you to feel aggressive when you, on those occasions you feel aggressive? What sets you off or what gets you in an aggressive mood? Now, if you, if you can't... You might want to pause this and make a list if there are lots of them, but uh, if you're having difficulty identifying anything that you can think of directly which causes you to be aggression, let me put that question in another way to you. What is lollipop rage? Have a think about it. What is lollipop rage? Pause the recording for a moment and then consider, make a few notes. Don't look it up. No cheating. Just in your own mind, what would you say lollipop rage is? Okay, now I've asked this question in a large number of classes to a good number of students and one of the answers I tend to get very quickly is people talking about uh, babies maybe, you know, taking away their, their lollipop and them getting angry about it. That's a good answer, but like the man said, it's not right. It's a good answer, but it's not right. In case you're wondering, and you can check this yourself if you like, lollipop rage describes the phenomenon that increasingly motorists are b being seen to drive very aggressively around uh, what are sometimes called um, crossing guards in America or lollipop men here in the UK. Essentially people who walk out into the road with a, a sign in order to stop the traffic and allow children and parents to cross usually get to, to get to a school. And you're having motorists now not only ignore these people or simply continue on driving when they see them walking out but in some cases actually accelerating towards them or shouting abuse at them as they pass. Now <laughs> considering the job these people are doing which is essentially to protect the lives of young children and parents it's amazing that they get the any kind of abuse let alone abuse from motorists who at most must be you know, delayed only by a short you know, minute or two or even a few seconds but they do. And lollipop rage is just one example of dozens of different rages that we are hearing about in the media. You know, we hear about road rage, we hear about air rage, you know, people, usually celebrities, flipping out on airplane flights and getting arrested or getting banned from that airline. Or we have phone rage or pavement rage or, you know, PC rage where you thump your computer or your smartphone because it keeps crashing or crashes at an inopportune time. Now all of these um, different kinds of rage, they, they seem to be something you only hear about in, re in recent years. You look back in the newspapers, 20, 30 years, you don't have people talking about rage. 
in the way that we talk about it. And this raises the question, are we simply talking about it more now than we used to? Are we pathologizing everything so that every time somebody loses their temper, we now try to call it some kind of rage rather than simply calling the person, you know, someone with a bad temper or uh, someone who's lost it? Um, or is, is our society becoming one which is more prone to aggression, more prone to people losing their temper? I don't know if I can answer a question on that scale, you know, what is the whole of society. But if you observe all the occasions where we talk about somebody having a rage, you may notice something interesting in common between all those situations. And that is that all of them involve some kind of frustration. The, the motorist who can't travel as fast as they need to to get to work on time or where they're going is frustrated. The, the person whose computer keeps crashing and so they can't check the thing they want to check online or type up the, the assignment they've got to finish, that person is frustrated. In fact, all of these kinds of rage seem to have at their heart some form of frustration. And that raises the question, is there a relationship between frustration and aggression? If you have ever wondered that, you're, you're not alone and you're certainly not the first um, to, to identify the person who really put the relationship or potential relationship between frustration and aggression on the map. You have to look at uh, Dollard and, uh, and uh, his research group back in 1939 and who can argue that 1939 was probably an excellent year to study aggression in all its forms. Uh, you might say this was the right research at the right time or at the wrong time, depending on your point of view. Now, interestingly, Dollard believed that um, anger was, was like a basic drive, like hunger. So that effectively it was a, almost a natural reaction to a biological uh, experience. So we uh, experience hunger when we don't have enough food. And as far as Dollard is concerned, we experience anger or aggression when we are in any way frustrated. And to Dollard, frustration represented the gap between expectation and attainment, which is a really nice way to put it. In effect, what Dollard is saying is that when we expect something to happen, but it doesn't happen, we expect when we expect to get to work quickly, but we're delayed, when we expect to um, have a piece of equipment work for us easily and effectively and it doesn't, or when we expect to be able to, to do something and somebody in in any way prevents us from doing that thing, there's now a gap between what we expected to happen and what actually happened. That's attainment. And Dollar believed that the bigger the gap between expectation and attainment, the, the greater the frustration, and that this frustration would lead to aggression. That aggression was a natural reaction to frustration. Um, and Dollar believed that when we experience aggression, that we can either direct it outwards towards the, the thing that is frustrating us or inwards towards ourself. We can, you know, become angry with ourselves or even in extreme cases sort of hostile towards ourselves, suicidal even. Um, or if we're ex projecting it outwards, we can project it either at the thing that's genuinely frustrating it or displace it onto something else or someone else. So the, the, the stereotypical being example being the person who comes home having had a bad day at work and kicks the cat. You know, we can't be frustrated with the person or the people that are actually causing our frustration, so we displace it towards something else. Now, interestingly, Dollard um, believed that the way then to deal with this was to find a way to release the anger in a controlled way, which he called a uh, catharsis, and not to have it bottled up or build up. And this is where we get the, the, the cultural idea that it's a bad thing to bottle up your anger. And as we'll see later, Dollard wasn't necessarily right on this and that releasing your anger may not necessarily be the healthy way to deal with it every time. Um, of course, Dollard's research was really the f just the first of many researches, studies which looked at this idea that frustration and aggression might be linked. Later on, another major uh, theory in this area developing on Dollard's work is Berkowitz. And um, Berkowitz essentially suggested that, agreed with Dollard that frustration was linked to aggression, but felt that frustration was just one of a number of things, negative environmental things, which are unpleasant to us. So frustration is unpleasant, but so are other things like noise and heat and, and uh, pain. And that the unpleasant experience produces anger. 
Um, now, Berkowitz didn't necessarily believe that anger had to inevitably be expressed as some kind of aggression. Uh, Berkowitz, uh, Berkowitz believed that anger would build up, but that as long as it wasn't triggered by anything, it would then dissipate on its own. Uh, but that if we perceived what Berkowitz called an aggressive cue, effectively a trigger for our, our anger, that that anger would then convert into aggression. Now, this leaves the question, of course, what might be, um, well, two things really. What are the other kinds of negative environmental influences that might produce anger? And then what are the triggers that might release it or sort of set it off? Let's consider the first of those, uh, environmental cues or causes for anger. Berkowitz didn't attempt to produce uh, some sort of definitive list of the things that could cause, uh, the negative experiences that cause anger. And so we actually have to look at a number of other studies which have attempted to um, identify the things that might be described as negative experiences which could lead to anger. Uh, Barron and Richardson tried to come up with a model which described all of them in some way, uh, and which they called the negative affect escape model, which essentially said that anything which we find unpleasant and which we can't get away from. Um, and so uh, will cause anger. Now in terms of what kinds of things, well that could be anything, it can be vary from person to person. I, I've listed some of them uh, below here, some heat is a very common one, I must admit that's one that bothers me more than some of the others, that I find that when the room and the temperature goes up or when the weather starts getting hot during the summer, I tend to be slightly shorter on my fuse, just a little bit light, a little bit more prone to anger. Um, but for other people it can be uh, crowding or noise or an unpleasant smell, for some, even extreme cold is the, can be uh, a trigger for anger because, again, a stream cold that you can't, uh, or a very strong cold that you can't get away from, is likely to be uh, a negative experience and therefore make you uh, susceptible to anger. Now, of course, if we remember from Berkowitz's original model, simply because we experience anger doesn't mean it's going to lead to aggression there were to need to be some kind of trigger or cue. And what kind of thing might that be? What kind of things trigger aggression? What kind of things set us off when we're feeling angry? Um, number one, top of the list, far above all the others almost, is, is perceived intent. The minute we recognise that someone is deliberately trying to frustrate us or deliberately trying to make our environment unpleasant, then it's likely to set off aggression every time. Um, because obviously if someone is trying to do that to you on purpose then of course you're going to feel hostile towards them for doing that. But you have to consider for a moment how often is someone actually deliberately trying to do that. The world is not full of Disney villains twirling their moustaches out to get us and often we have no idea why somebody's doing what they do. I mean this is something looked at in the area of psychology known as attribution, where we try to figure out why people do the things they do. Often we're, we're guessing. We're making an informed guess based on what we know about them and how we see the situation around us, but nonetheless, we rarely know for certain why people do what they do. We simply guess. Why would we be likely to assume or guess that someone is doing it on purpose? Well, um, Often that's a bias that occurs in the way that we explain our behaviour and the behaviour of others, known as the actor-observer effect. When we are trying to explain our own behaviour, we're more likely to sort of take into account environmental factors and they're likely to feature highly in the explanation. But when we're trying to explain the behaviour of others, often we put personality at the top of the list as to why they're doing what they do and don't take environment into account as much as we should. Now, what this is likely to result in is that more often than we should, we're likely to put down someone's behaviour to their personality. And therefore, if their behaviour is frustrating us, we're likely to see that as a reflection of their personality, in which case we're more likely to blame them personally and thus more likely to be aggressive as a result of what they've done because we believe or we perceive that they are doing it intentionally. And if you want to recognise that kind of thinking in yourself or in people you know, 
consider the the last time somebody drove in a way that was, uh, in your view, dangerous or incredibly insensitive or simply ignorant. Uh, you know, someone cut straight in front of you or pulled out without warning or drove very slowly, much more slowly than you thought was necessary in, in the conditions. How did you explain that to yourself or how did the person you know who was driving explain it? Did they put it down to the, the environment, think, oh well, possibly it's a bit rainy or, oh well, I guess that's a sensible speed for these roads or, oh well, I guess the, it was difficult to see me and so they pulled out without realising I was there. More often than not, we don't think that way. We think, oh my God, this is one of those idiot, you know, um, speed boy racers, you know, uh, boy racers who uh, sort of get a car when they're too young and drive like they're the only person on the road. Or often we have theories about people who drive certain models of car. Oh yeah, that car, you know, everybody who drives that is a, well, an unrepeatable word who doesn't care about anybody else. And what we're doing there is we're blaming them personally. And as a result, we're more likely to be aggressive in our own driving because our anger with what they've done turns into aggression because we perceive it as them deliberately trying to frustrate us or deliberately trying to endanger us. Now, in truth, we've no reason for believing that. And in fact, if we tried to see their behavior as a product of the situation, we'd blame them less and be less aggressive in our drone driving, which would make us safer drivers. So it's, it's worth doing, it's worth considering. But as I said before, the perception that someone is deliberately trying to frustrate you is n often the number one trigger for producing aggression from anger. Um, other things which trigger anger are, are more interesting in some ways because they're, they're less obvious. Um, the sight of a weapon is often a trigger for anger to become aggression. Now, you might think that that's a result of somebody waving a weapon in your face or having a weapon and making you feel threatened. But interestingly, even if the weapon is simply present in the room, but inaccessible to everybody involved, so nobody can get at the weapon, but there just is a weapon there, that seems to be a trigger for aggression. So it seems the sight of a weapon is something that causes us to slip into a more aggressive reaction if we're already angry. Now this raises some very interesting questions about issues such as arming the police. Would arming the police make our society safer? Well, if the presence of a weapon, even if it's a weapon not held by any of the people involved, is makes aggression more likely, then the idea of armed police on the streets might actually increase incidences of aggression, not decrease them. Last but not least, alcohol, and I don't think this will surprise anybody too much, is, is a potential trigger. And it's not necessarily that actually consuming alcohol triggers aggression as you consume it, but rather that alcohol, as I'm sure anybody who's had a drink will know, reduces inhibitions uh, so that we're more likely to act on our impulses. Interestingly, alcohol also ends up narrowing our focus. They call it alcohol myopia. And it means that often we're less aware of what's going on around us and much more focused on a small, narrow area of things. Maybe the person we're talking to, the person we're dealing with. Now consider what I said a few minutes ago, that often when we focus on the individual, we tend to attribute their behavior entirely to their personality and less to the environment. Well, if alcohol makes us even less attentive to the environment, we're likely to even more focus on the individual and even more blame them for their behavior. So the person who bumps into us as we're walking down the road when we're maybe at one too many, we're more likely to see that as them deliberately picking a fight with us rather than accidentally bumping into us. And this might explain why when we've had too much to drink or even just a little bit to drink, we're more prone to being triggered into anger because of this effect that drink has on us. As I said earlier, um, Dollard in his original research and some that followed it believed that um, anger and aggression was a natural reaction to frustration but that the, the problem was not that you experienced it, but rather how you managed it. And as far as Dollard was concerned, the best way to deal with your anger was to, or your frustration, if you like, resulting in anger, was to find a healthy way to release it. And this was described as catharsis, essentially finding an acceptable output for your aggression. So that when you come home feeling angry rather than kicking the cat or picking a fight with your partner, that instead you maybe went down to the gym and worked out or did a bit of boxing you know in a sparring with a sparring partner or you know 
went out to the, the tennis court or the baseball diamond and whacked a few balls around to, to sort of burn off the aggression. And catharsis for a long time was considered to be a, a good way of people who were having difficulty with their levels of aggression of, of, of managing it better. Interestingly, um, more recent research and sort of development in our perspectives on this have, have changed our view on catharsis in that it's no longer considered to be always healthy. In fact, in some cases, it can be quite unhealthy. And the concern has, has grown around the fact that there are certain things about catharsis which are troubling uh, in terms of its effectiveness. One Number one has to be that catharsis doesn't in any way tackle the root of the frustration. Then effectively, as you blow off steam, you know, punching a, uh, a punching bag down the gym or whacking tennis balls across the court, you're not actually dealing with the thing that's causing the frustration in the first place, whatever that might be. And as such, the frustration isn't going away. So it's, it's a very temporary solution. The other problem is, and this is sort of drawing from kind of cognitive behavioral theory, that in a sense what we learn from catharsis is that frustration should be turned into anger and that that's how you deal with frustration. You turn it into anger and you release it. Now, the people who advocate catharsis, we make the, the point of saying that the yes, this is true, but only in acceptable ways. However, releasing frustration in the form of anger is likely to be a, a, a rewarding experience. It takes away a negative thing, and we call that negative reinforcement. And so it teaches you that that's what you do when you get frustrated. You, you release it as aggression. And there's a real concern that although you learn to do this in one environment, that the lesson is likely to carry over into other environments. They call this generalization. So that you learn, yeah, I'll blow off steam down the gym, but that the next time you get frustrated at work, your natural conditioned impulse will be to blow that frustration off as anger, except you're now going to do it at work rather than in the gym. So that in fact, it may teach you the wrong lesson, that instead of learning to deal with your frustration in other ways, you learn the lesson that the way to deal with frustration is to turn it into anger and release it. And that uh, although it's supposed to be something you do in certain circumstances, you'll end up doing it in other ones as well, because the lesson will end up generalizing across to places where it wasn't intended. As such, there's, there's more of a, an opposition these days to catharsis as a, as a way to handle frustration. And um, other methods, such as directly tackling the frustration itself, uh, or, you know, finding new ways to interpret frustrating situations through cognitive behavioural therapy is, is now considered to be preferable as a way of dealing with people who have uh, what we call anger management issues. So where does that leave us? Well, um, what our exploration of the potential causes for aggression seems to show is that certainly very highly featured among these causes is frustration. Um, although the original theory by Dollar has been developed and refined, the fundamental idea that in some way frustration is linked to aggression uh, has never gone away. And as such, it's still considered to be a, a very important cause of aggression. Although it now sits alongside other causes, other things that we find unpleasant or uh, sort of uh, in any way negative about environment can e equally be linked to aggression. Um, it's important to realize though that the link between frustration and other negative environmental cue, uh, uh, factors and aggression is not necessarily a direct one that they're generally is recognized to be some kind of cue or trigger which causes the anger to be become aggression and uh, there are a number of these out there the, the best known is probably the perceived intention to, to frustrate or the perceived intention to be negative in some way and that uh, any person or anything that we believe is being deliberately trying to make our life more unpleasant is likely to become a focus of our aggression. Um, finally, it's interesting to note that uh, there are viewpoints on the dangers of, if you like, bottling up your aggression or the healthiness of finding ways to release it have changed as well, that it's no longer considered to be as unhealthy to 
control your aggressive impulses that actually learning that kind of control is now generally seen to be a positive thing and similarly it's no longer considered to always be a, a, a positive thing to to find ways to blow off steam or release aggression even though as we saw with the the violent video games research that's still in many ways I think totally thought to be a good thing that some way that allows us to blow off steam is, is a positive thing some of the research now suggests that this might not be the case and that we might actually be learning uh, a bad way to manage our frustrations if we learn to always convert them into aggression even if we originally learn it in acceptable manners hopefully this general exploration of aggression both in terms of its origins and its causes has given you uh, food for thought certainly about the aggression you may occasionally experience inside yourself and those that you witness in others and um, as always uh, the interesting thing about studying any of psychology is to notice how much you notice it from this point onwards um, so the next time somebody cuts in front of you uh, on the motorway or drives a little bit too slowly when you're rushed to get to somewhere try to remember that that issue about frustration and aggression and the tendency to blame people more than we should for deliberately frustrating us and maybe just maybe you'll be able to let it go Thanks very much for listening and I hope you found this interesting and enjoyable.